America we know, a land of bountiful harvests in the fields, of millions of board feet of lumber from the forest, of millions of barrels of oil drawn from the depths of the earth, of human ingenuity at work in plant and factory for the enrichment of us all. But more importantly, our America is a land of people people who thrill to the speed of a fast-breaking play on the court, to a well-hit ball on the diamond, or to the rushing break of waves against a curving beach. People who live in the friendly atmosphere of smaller communities, or join the quick-step tempo of the larger cities. People who respect learning and send their young to school and worship the God of their own choice in reverence and in freedom. People who cherish the quiet streets of their own neighborhood and find their greatest happiness in the circle of their own family. Yes, this is the America we know and love. An America of a people at peace. Of a people protected in control of the skies largest of America's guardians of the peace is the far-ranging B-36. This mighty dreadnought is built at Fort Worth, Texas, in the Fort Worth plant of Consolidated Balls E Aircraft Corporation, a prime producer among the nation's aircraft facilities. The factory has more than three million square feet of floor space, an assembly line a mile long, and a working force of more than 14,000 people. Not all members of the bomber building team work on the assembly line. Top management, Floyd Odlum at left and Lamont Cohue, seek out and guide the solutions to hundreds of vexing problems. Officers of the Air Materiel Command, veteran airmen and experienced engineers in their own right, help to improve designs and break production bottlenecks. Draftsmen and designers create and plan, and scores of office workers process orders for basic materials. Closer to the assembly line are tool makers. They fashion the tools which make the parts that are assembled into the completed aircraft. The planning payoff comes on the assembly line. Here, component parts of the B-36 are joined together at mating points. The bomber comes into being as fuselage, wings, and other sections are mated along the line. Smaller parts are joined in sub-assemblies off the main line. They flow into the assembly bay from mezzanine and floor level stations. The bubble type pilot canopy built on the mezzanine is carried by overhead crane to the assembly mating point and fitted to its proper place atop the forward fuselage of the plane. Farther along the line, riveters join sections of sheet aluminum into the skin of a bomber to be. Inside the fuselage, other craftsmen are less noisy, but just as active on bomb bay installations and wiring. And at floor level, workmen fit on a double nose wheel. With its outer wing panels in place, the B-36 is so wide, it must be moved diagonally along its final assembly path. Propellers for six pusher-type engines are installed near the end of the line. These are mounted on the wing's rear or trailing edge. High above are craftsmen charged with completing the tail assembly. The top of the rudder is 46 feet above the factory floor, higher than on a four-story building. Meal service is another streamlined operation. The chow train drops its carts at spur points, and production workers are spared a long walk to the cafeteria. Yes, airplanes and aircraft production have come a long way in a few decades. Less than half a century has passed since the Wright brothers made the first powered aircraft flight in their Kitty Hawk biplane a flight of 120 feet. The entire distance spanned in that historic hop is little more than half the wingspan of today's B-36. The bomber is 230 feet from wingtip to wingtip. Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. As far back as that, Major General Hap Arnold, chief of the air arm, who later became America's first five-star airman, 
originally urged the need for an intercontinental bomber. A plane that could reach the then Axis enemies without the requirement of overseas bases. And here, after years of progressive research on the part of science and industry, of teamwork by all concerned with the development of adequate air power, is the ultra-long-range B-36. It is able to take off from bases on this continent, fly across the ocean, polar wastes or vast deserts, penetrate enemy defenses without fighter escort, destroy the strategic targets, and return home non-stop without mid-air refueling. From production to operation, Carswell Air Force Base at Fort Worth is operational headquarters for the B-36. It is located one mile from the consolidated Balti plant, just across the field. Headquarters for the 8th Air Force, with its 7th and 11th bomb groups, is also at Carswell. Major General Roger Ramey, commanding the 8th Air Force, has an exacting assignment. His organization must be prepared on minimum notice to conduct long-range offensive bombardment anywhere in the world. This mission requires the most effective manning, training, and equipment. It calls for continuous briefing conferences, schooling, and training missions. The job of teaching airmen how to service and maintain their super bombers is a major task in itself. But the Air Training Command is ready for the job. So the planes are kept at the peak of condition, ready to roar when the command to action comes. With the bombers serviced and ready to go, flight crews take over for a training mission. The pilot captain completes his final inspection. The crew splits up to board their plane. Up the nose ladder goes one group. Another boards at the rear entrance, 50 yards away. Ready to roll now. A tractor pulls the big plane with a taxi strip. The engines, which create hurricane winds, are started away from the parking ramp to prevent possible damage to buildings or equipment. Despite its great size, the B-36 is light-footed. It has an eight-wheel truck-type or roller skate main gear and can operate from any airstrip that accommodates medium-sized bombers. While taxiing to the takeoff point, the crew makes last-minute checks on equipment and the control tower is contacted for flight clearance. Now they're ready for the takeoff. The tower flashes the green light. Away they go.
and in altitude to any other known tool experience proves the B-36 a rugged opponent for interceptors. The biggest bomber delivers the biggest bomb. Besides the atomic bomb, the B-36 carries two huge Grand Slam or earthquake bombs weighing up to 21 tons each. These Grand Slammers total 84,000 pounds, a record for bomb loads delivered from the air. Behind the scenes, the job of preparedness goes on. A resources planning study projects the requirements for getting more B-36s built and into the air in a hurry if the need should arise. It lists the materials, facilities, manpower, and production tools required for mass delivery of the super bombers to avoid being too late with too little. Meantime, the B-36 is being steadily improved. Jet engines mount in pairs or pods at the outer edges of the wing will supplement the six conventional power plants, giving the super bomber even greater performance. And now in the transport version of the B-36, ready to deliver hundreds of combat troops and heavy loads of priority cargo. Present and former commanders of the 8th Air Force, generals like Roger Ramey, Curtis LeMay, boss of the Strategic Air Command, like Carl Spots at left and Ira Eaker, William Kepner and Clements McMullen, know that air power is peace power, survival insurance, because when reason fails, strength prevails. This rule of human survival has served America well in past times of peril, to keep men and nations free. And strength in this atomic age means air power, air power to defend, and air power to strike back. If potential aggressors know, in advance, that any armed attack will be met with instant retaliation, there may well be no attack. So today, the mission of the B-36 is the protection of America. Today, the target is peace. <laughs>